This is Classic FM. Hello, I'm David Miller, one of the Classic FM stable of presenters. Let loose on the web. How wonderful is that? And let loose with Stephen Huff, who, yeah, as you well know, Stephen, and I might as well share it with whoever chooses to look at this, uh, someone I have long admired as one of the finest pianists in the world. I see you, Stephen, and I don't know whether you, know, you, 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 you want to accept this as mere flattery or you would honestly see this as a genuine assessment of yourself. As a pianist with intellectual rigor, but who also has a sweet tooth, you love some of the things where pianists show off. I don't mean show off in a self-regarding way, but beautiful encore pieces, that uh, bits of Godofsky and stuff like that, that in a way have almost gone out of fashion, but mm. I've always loved. Well, I love the craft of playing the piano as well as the music written for it. And I think that's something that was lost a little bit after the Second World War. People started to think you either could choose between only being a sort of technician or only being a musician, and somehow they couldn't go together. So I've always enjoyed all kinds of music. Um, of course, the, the pieces that, that one comes back to time and time again are the great works, mm. the works that, that go deep into, into the human experience. But I don't think that precludes the chocolate mint. Sure. Or indeed the cookies that I saw earlier you were <laughs> eating with great pleasure. I'm afraid I did, yes. <laughs> yes, I fear you've, you've, you've caught me out on another of my weaknesses. I have a genuine sweet tooth and not just for music. Um, we, are, we lose you for too many months of the year, but Tuesday you're at the Wigmore Hall. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, it's the fourth in a series, um, the last one actually, of um, concerts focusing on the piano quintet which is almost like a small piano concerto. It's this big ensemble where the strings threaten at times even to drown the piano. So many composers wrote some of the most wonderful music for that um, format. And I put together four programs, and this is the English program, focusing on the uh, Elgar Quintet. And I'm joined by the Endelian Quartet, English group, and I play some William Byrd piano pieces. They play the Britain Third Quartet, and then we join together for the Elgar Quintet. And it's an interesting thing uh, this weekend because they were all very attached to the monarchs of their mm. time. William Byrd escaped persecution even though he was a Catholic mm. at a very difficult time, but Queen Elizabeth respected him and liked him and sort of gave him... And she was musical, of course. Yeah. And indeed, her fa inculcated into her by her father, Henry VIII, who you know, we only think of now as a sort of rather fat lecher, but he was actually rather a skilled musician. He yeah. wrote some interesting That's stuff. Right. Yeah. Yes. And then, of course, Britain was very close to our present queen. Um, mm. It was an order of merit at the end of his life, and Lord Britain even. Yes. And then Elgar, uh, he seems to be more Edwardian than, than King Edward VII in many ways. He seems to, to be part of that whole vic late Victorian, um, early 20th century understanding of what England was as the empire was sort of coming See, to an end slowly. It's a, the only <clears throat> sadness I have about, you know, this is not a moment to voice any criticism of our present queen, but I'm afraid she's not a music lover. I'm afraid when George V came in, he went down and um, rebuked the military, brand, uh, the military band playing outside Buckingham Palace for playing some selections from Richard Strauss. Mm. And he said, if I ever uh, hear that again, I'll have you all shot. And that was because Edward VII was musical oh. and his wife was very musical and used to go to Covent Garden at least 20 times a season and they That's sat through all the Richard Strauss operas yeah. and it was he who really picked up Elgar, made him an OM, made him a, um, uh, a um, uh, gave, you know, gave him various other honours. I feel that was good for Elgar and not so good for Elgar. Good for Elgar in the sense it fed his uh, it, it, it did something to correct his sense of social inadequacy. Wasn't so good for Elgar because it made people think he was just the, you know, the man who wrote hymns about the complacency of Edwardian England. But I think the, the, the quintet is actually quite moving. Oh, it's you? a fantastic piece. And it's really the last piece he wrote. He didn't write anything significant after that. He lived another 15 years. So maybe what you're saying about the, all these honours and the OM, it made him maybe a little bit complacent. Yeah the sense that he didn't have to struggle anymore as he had so much at the beginning of the century with, uh, after the Enigma Variations. And, and it was a tough struggle for him. I just wrote a piece about it today in, in my Telegraph blog about how all these three composers on this program were outsiders because mm. Elgar was from a sort Very of lo lower middle class yeah. background from the Midlands. You know, what possibly could come from the Midlands yeah. and make it in London high social life? Uh, Byrd, of course, was uh, sort of persecuted for his religious beliefs, and then Britain being gay and also pacifist. Um, so all three yes, of them he even... felt an outsider all the way outsider. through. 
Elgar became an insider because he married the much older uh, wife who was the uh, widow of an Indian Army general. And I remember Michael Kennedy, who's written very well about Elgar, saying yeah. to me, he never wrote anything that was worth anything before he met her, and he never wrote anything that was worth listening to after That's she died. And of course, you're right, that was the last piece because she died not long after that. But I love the piano quintet. I'm so glad you've taken it up. And i tell you why. Because although I suspect the piano part is not especially rewarding, mm -hmm. the tunes are great, but yeah. don't you feel sometimes the strings have got the best bits? You, you've <laughs> nailed it there. It's, it's actually a slightly frustrating piece to play because it's awkward, it's not easy to play, but you never really have a moment of glorious music making. You're always an accompanist to what's going on. But I think the music is so wonderful that I'm quite happy to assume that role and to allow the viola to have that amazing tune in the slow movement. And, and how rare it is for the viola to have anything worth playing. Indeed, I but I think viola he was a viola, wasn't he? Yes, and, in, so. and, and indeed in that, um, another underrated piece, we're not talking, we're talking about you, not about Elgar, so I'll move hastily on. But, <laughs> you know, in the South, yeah. uh, a much underrated uh, concert overture, he called it, symphonic poem, I guess we call it, there's a lovely solo for the viola. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. whereas I once said to a friend of mine in the London Philharmonic viola section, what's it like playing uh, the viola part in a Bruckner symphony. He said, it's like papering the back bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, then you're off. Then I'm off. I go to Chicago, well, to New York for a couple of days to look at the work on the kitchen in my apartment, and uh, the bathroom rather, to make sure it's going ahead. And then I go on to Chicago to play in the Chicago Symphony recital series. Uh, that concert is on Sunday next week. And then from there I go to Seattle, one of my favorite American cities, mm -hmm. to play Rachmaninoff III. With the Seattle with the Symphony. With the Seattle well. Symphony. And uh, Ludwig Morlow, who's their new um, music director. Uh, one of the great things about going to a city like that in America, apart from being on the waterfront and having wonderful mm. tea and food and seafood, is you get to play a piece four times because the American orchestra... They do four programs. They do four say, programs. Yeah. And they can fill the hall every time. And they can fill the hall. One of the most magnificent halls in the world, the Banner Royal Hall, newly built, I think, about 10, 15 years ago. An absolutely wonderful place. And from there I go to Asia, actually. I'm going to the Malaysian Philharmonic and then go to Singapore to the piano festival there to do a recital. And then I have about a month off from playing concerts. But you also, of course, I remember you telling me, playing a concert in mainland China and being worried about how it had gone because the clapping was very tepid, but then it went on for half an hour. Well, so, well yeah, it wasn't quite <laughs> half an hour, but it, it was very astonishing because I finished playing Rapunzel on third. And I, I mean, really, you could play every other note wrong in that piece and it would still have Make a certain effect, kind of yes. enthusiastic yes. response. Yes. And there was a sort of like this, rather like a, a, the third speech at someone's wedding that you know people just wanted to get everything over with. And I thought, oh dear, I can't have been that bad, surely. <laughs> but then I kept coming off and on, off and on, and played one encore and the same, and then played a second encore. And then the presenter said, oh, the audience love you here. And I thought, well, it's the strangest way. Um, but still, every audience is, is different. And I think some audiences just feel that they need to be polite, others just let rip. America, of course, they're very used to cheering and stamping. And the most, I think, actually even worse than the Chinese experience was um, is sometimes an experience in Holland where you always get a standing ovation. Every concert people get up on their feet and you think, oh, that's nice, and walk off the stage and the applause stops. So it means nothing. So yeah. it's strange how different countries have different conventions about how they show their appreciation. Anyway, you, you travel all over the world. It plainly doesn't weary you because you look... Uh, Nice and fresh. And when now we've got a, a, a French album, which I'm going to be talking to you about in a couple of months yeah. time when it comes out. Uh, French album back on Hyperion in September. When is your next uh, concert on these shores? How long do we have to wait? Well, of course, next Tuesday is the Wigmore uh, yes, that we've no, we, spoken we, about. Yeah. After that, I am an uh, artist in residence with the BBC Symphony next season. So I'll be playing three concertos across the season with that orchestra. I'm playing the Hummel A minor in October. Mm. And then in the spring, I'll play both Brahms concertos in different concerts. Right. So a, a, a small undertaking. A small undertaking. Well, Stephen, <laughs> I trust you survive your global travels well, and we look forward to seeing you back with some Brahms in the autumn. In, well, Brahms is in the spring, Hummel in the autumn. Excellent. This is Classic FM.